So thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, I tend to go very quickly. So it's going to be behoove you to stop me if the spirit moves you and we can have a discussion because there's lots to discuss. And any point we want to stop and just discuss, it'll be a good point. Okay? But I do want to convince you of a few things. So um, I am a systems biologist and a synthetic biologist. I'm both. And the reason is because um, I believe that the engineering of cells is as much about garnering trust as it is about garnering effect. And trust means that when I say the cell is going to do something, it does it and doesn't do something else. And to understand that process, to understand what a cell is doing, you have to understand the world in which it lives. Um, and in fact, you have to understand the world in which the pathway that you implant in a cell lives, and you have to understand the world in which the gene in that pathway is, and so on. And that's all called context. So my fundamental goal in life, ultimately, is to be able to engineer organisms to live where I want them to while performing an action that I prescribe and not affect the ecology around them, except in the way that I design. That's a very tall order. It requires a degree of knowledge we don't yet have, period, and a degree of control we don't yet have. But I'm going to try to explain why I think this is important to do. Um, this slide is getting a bit old, but I want to, I want to show it to you anyway. Um, I come from physical chemistry, like everything to be two-dimensional graphs at all, poss at all possible. This is a two-dimensional graph made by a bunch of uh, folk who met in uh, Davos, Switzerland, sat in round in hot tubs, and tried to plan how the Earth was going to come to an end. Um, uh, th this is, this is uh, the World Economic Forum. These are people who are global risk analysts. Um, these people worry about how, how things are going to happen. And so they, they come up with things that are the problem. And they plot things in two-dimensional graphs like this. So you have on the bottom axis the likelihood of an event happening. And at, on the other y-axis, you have the impact of it happening. And so up, up in this corner, I'm going to claim I have a pointer someplace here. Maybe I don't. Well, I don't. Um, up in that corner, way over there, on the upper right corner, is chronic fiscal imbalance. Okay? So that's a likely impact. We're all are experiencing it right now, and it's very high impact. Okay? That's, that's, the, that's the case. So this is all the things they thought were really important. And I've circled things on there that I'm going to blow up in a moment. Here they are blown up. The thing to take away from these topics is they're all biology in the loop someplace in their problem. They all intimately contact biology. Some of them you might not think of that first. Water supply crises, you might not think about that. But in fact, part of the water supply crisis isn't just that there isn't a lot of water. We're living in California, there's not a lot of water. But that the water that it does exist is highly polluted <laughs> and not recyclable and, and awful. Um, and what's more is that that impacts ecosystems in ways that are actually quite extreme. And so understanding how, that, how the, the feedback between water and the, and, and the, and the ecosystem works is going to be very important. Food shortages, extreme volatility, energy and agricultural prices, that's also traceable to bio, to, in some case to biology. Sometimes it's petroleum, obviously. But I think that a lot of the work in bioenergy, it's not that it's an economically viable thing to replace petroleum but it is an economically viable way to tamp down its volatility economically, which is a way, perhaps, of changing the way that we actually operate in the world. Agriculture is a very similar object. Greenhouse gas emissions, you can go green with things. Antibiotic resistance bacteria, I think, is underappreciated. And um, this is a good example of why uh, economics is awful, uh, because there's no economics to make new antibiotics. And yet, it, it's killing us. <laughs> um, we have to figure out ways of making that cheap and easy to, to, to work with. There's land and water misuse, land use in particular. We're not using land the way it should be used. Rising rate of chronic disease and vulnerability to pandemics. So these are all things that they call out as being important. Now, oddly enough, this group meets in Davos. And then another group, uh, the month after, thereafter, meets in Abu Dhabi. And they have another set of hot tubs, I guess. And they sit around in Abu Dhabi. And they think, well, given that these, these risk analysts came up, these are the problems, how should we solve those problems? And so they come up with a top 10 list. Now, this list, when it came out, shocked me. This is it. Number one, informatics. Always good to have information. OK, we can all agree. You should have some way of taking that information and doing something with it. All the things you see sort of in green there, though, are basically biology. Again, they're sort of quantitative biology. They're bioengineering of one sort or another. Synthetic biology and metabolic engineering is number two on their top 10 list, which means they don't know very much <laughs> because we're not there yet. <laughs> But I understand why they think it. They think it because if we could bring biology 
in, you know, to bear on some of the problems you saw in the last slide, we could have a great effect. It would be difficult to have any other way. And I'll explain why in a moment. However, you'll notice a couple other things here. Five and nine are about biological information management. Personalized medicine is about biological information management. It's about knowing who you are, having that data in a model that's related to all of everyone else on Earth and how they've responded to whatever treatment you want to give them. And you place you into that model and you say, this is how you should treat this person. So it's this idea that you have things characterized well enough, organized in the right way, served in the right fashion, so that I could ask, model, I could ask predictive questions of what's going to happen. And synthetic biology is nothing, nothing, if not the desire to make biological engineering predictable. It's not to engineer biology it per se, because that's been going on since the 70s. It's to make it predictable, like personalized medicine is supposed to be predictable. That's where we are. Now, people have been doing this for many, many years. And, and I just want to point out that, that you know, if you just look at the, at the impact of engineering biological systems on the world, there's been a lot of them. There have been. Um, both natural and simulated and engineered plants and microbes for cleaning w w soil, water, and air. There have been um, microbes and plants optimized for renewable food and chemical production. Actually, food's becoming, you think the Green Revolution was big. The next generation of new food is going to be spectacular. And we can talk about that offline And for those of you who are nervous about that. But I, I wouldn't be. Um, I think that. This is kind of interesting. You know, the, the microbial production of antibiotics has gone through four or five major chemical revolutions since the 70s, each one a boom and a bust cycle. I think we're doomed for another boom. <laughs> Hopefully, that would be sustainable. But for example, uh, my colleague um, uh, Jay Keesing became very, you know, famous for artemisinin, which is the last line you know, um, antimalarial drug made now in yeast, and can make the entire world's dosage in a single vat now, which has social consequences, but there you are. And I don't know how much you guys know, but your, your neighbor down, down the coast here a little bit, Craig Venter, for example, gets bits, gets, you know, literally gets sequences of DNA from viruses in China, synthesizes those viruses, and builds vaccine strains within a week of getting that information. So we're, we're in this new realm of being able to get information and turn it into biological action right now. And really spectacularly are things like Carl June's engineered T cell therapies, where you could actually engineer the T cell receptor and the back end single transduction pathways. So we recognize your cancer or no one else's cancer and kill that cancer dead. And he's actually cured people within error <laughs> using, these, these <laughs> using these technologies. I think the next big thing is microbial gut communities for treating things like Crohn's disease. But do any of you know what the what, one of the most effective treatments for Crohn's disease is right now? Anyone know what that, that, that? You know what it is. Yeah, fecal, fecal transplant. That's right. So you actually get the, the poop of your, of, your, of your housemate, and you transplant it into yourself, and you can do it. But it's because that community is robust. That community forms a unit that is robust. And when it comes out of balance, it becomes robust in a way that's bad for you and good for it. And when you, want, when you restore that community to, to, the, to its balance, it works on that. What's the principles of that operation? Why do, they, why do they form this interoperable, modular community that confers health upon you or doesn't? What are the principles of that? How do I engineer that? So people are getting there and beginning to understand that. And we have the new, new tools that get us there now. And we have a bunch of stretch goals that I think are going are gonna, to, you know, th that we can think about just so we motivate why we're doing this sort of work. I, I won't, I, I'm not going to, you know, you don't have to read these things. I think that what it comes down to is this. Imagine I could engineer a microbe or a plant that could fix its own nitrogen. Imagine I could make microbes that could mobilize phosphorus. Phosphorus is actually a limited resource. We're in trouble with phosphorus. If I could get rid of the need for fertilizers, I would change the economy of agriculture in an incredibly positive way. I would vastly decrease the impact on the environment for large-scale agriculture. And I would eliminate the drain on a major natural resource. So imagine building microbes and plants that just got rid of you know, um, the need for those fertilizers. Imagine being able to predict, given a new virus, its probability of, of epidemic. Because it's a probability thing. I have this thing, I know how, it's, how it looks and how it's designed. And what's the probability that it's going to instantiate in people and move? We know from a social perspective, we've been going through it right now. Ebola is a good example. 
We have models of how Ebola spreads. And we kind of, are, you know, it's frightening disease, but we're not frightened of it in the same way because we know what its dynamics are. But a new flu virus, we're very bad at that, it turns out. And so we wanted to understand that better. We want to be like at the point we get the point. So there's all these things we want to be able to do. Now, I'm not gonna, let's, let's not talk about this because we have, we have fun at time. I want to talk about why biology is a good source for, um, uh, for, for bioengineering. So the first thing are some crazy numbers. There's about 10 to the 30th bacteria on Earth. 10 to the 30th. That's a big number. That's more than the number of stars in the universe. Give you some sense of things. Now, that may not be surprising because, you know, stars are big and bacteria are small, but it's still pretty amazing. So 10 to 11 stars in the Milky Way, 10 to 12 in the universe, that's a lot of bacteria. There's about 10 to the 6 bacteria in a gram of soil, about 10 to the 5th species in a gram of soil. So in San Francisco, there's 10 to 6 people in San Francisco, and we're all one species, though. You know, we may seem different, but we're identical as far as 16S is concerned. You know? <laughs> right? Um, the bacteria, these are very different from each other. They're very tight communities. They're extremely interactive. They're incredibly social. They're vastly promiscuous, far more promiscuous than we are. They trade DNA at astounding rates. Um, and yet they've learned how to live together, not that they're not at war, they are, <laughs> in this very dense community in, 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 in soil, for example. Um, and one of the most intimate things about us is not the way we speak to each other, but the way we transmit this information between each other. We, about, we emit about 10 to the 6 microbes per hour, of which about 1,000 are taken up by nearby people. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we're constantly communicating. <laughs> I know, you're thinking, you're looking at the person next to you, aren't you? And you're going, ew. <laughs> it's nice. It's good. You're all becoming adapted to each other. <laughs> uh, it's good. No, uh, in, in all seriousness, I think it is good. We do have infections we pass back and forth, but also we stabilize our communities by doing this. And I think one of the things to take home from this is this, is that bacteria live anywhere. Anywhere life can live, you find a bacterium that lives there. There's this vast web of discussion among microbes. They pass DNA about, they pass viruses about, a lot of sexually transmitted diseases of, of, of bacteria, for example. And they pass amongst all the animals and plants on Earth. They're one of the things that most connect us together, is that DNA flow. And so understanding that web is one of the most important things. It's also one of our biggest leverage points, because we can pull on that network in various ways and affect a lot of things simultaneously. I don't understand that. That gets down to what bacteria are. They're about a four megabase genome. That's actually a fairly big one. There are bigger ones. Our glass will get up to 12, actually. And, you know, yeast, yeast, a eukaryote is around six. You know, Saccharomyces. But six, six megabase, but about 10 to the third genes, about 1,000 genes. But I have around 8,000 genomes in the flash drive in my pocket at the moment, just, you know, as, as information. And um, there are a sense in compute and do systems containing 10 to the 15th, 10 to the minus 15th liters, a femtoliter. They have hundreds of sensors do complex logic, and can actuate mechanical and chemical change in the environment by doing this. They're also short programs. I mean, think about how, how big Word is as a program, your word processor. It's much, much bigger than four megabytes, right? But it can't live in, 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 in a tube room at the bottom of a heat vent. Well, it's not meant to either, but there it is. Uh, these guys can. They can live anywhere, anywhere that, that, that life can live, there's bacteria. We actually went down um, 2.4 kilometers toward the center of the Earth in a South African gold mine, broke open a, a rock wall, and behind that rock wall there was a microbe which had taken over an entire thing and was living on, on, electrolytically, on radiolytically cleaved water, more or less. Anywhere life can live, away from the sun, away from plants. There's, these, they're, they're, they're short solutions that solve the problem of survival. And so they have a vast amount of reserve of activity. There's about 10 to the third proteins per cell, about 10 to the seventh interactions amongst those proteins per cell, roughly, in a bacterium. In a human, it's vastly larger than that. Um, and, and about 60,000 different classes of protein, um, which have very diverse activities. And so if you map these, you have 1,000 proteins all evolutionally adapted to every environment that you can live on Earth. The chemical activity space is enormous. Not that people like Pete Schultz can't expand it, but, but it's enormous, and you can do nearly anything. A couple of other things have happened in recent years that are worth mentioning. So what we have now 
is the ability to actually look at all those microbes in extreme detail. And you'll see curves like this a lot, a lot these days. This is the cost per base pair of sequencing on a log-log scale. These are so-called Moore's Law-like plots. And the point is, is that we are, we are the, the cost per, I don't have a pointer for some reason, but that's OK. Um, the cost per base pair is decreasing exponentially. And the length of the reads are increasing, not exponentially. <laughs> and so our ability to sequence the Earth has become amazing. In my own laboratory, we've done, in the last year, um, I think it's 3,000 communities over time and space <laughs> in a valley, in a, in, in, from a valley in Tennessee, because it's a contamination location. And we're able to see how every microbe is changing in time in ways that you couldn't have seen before. I can, of course, I sequence about 96 microbes a week in my lab. By the way, when I started as a professor just, just 14 years ago, I said I was never going to do any sequencing whatsoever because it was boring. Um, there's new functional sequencing. So right now, there's 200 different ways of measuring genetic function with sequence, not just sequence, but you know, RNA, methylation, actually some enzyme activity, things like this. Um, but I'll give you another example. My colleague, Trent Northern, we've been able to measure the metabolic profile of knockout mutants of every gene in 100 organisms this last year. So think about it that way. That's 4,000 genes per organism knocked out, 4,000 metabolic profiles, 100 organisms. So you know, that's 4,000 times you know, 100. That's 4,000. And then we did that over 1,000 conditions, all using a mass spec. <laughs> that's an incredible change in our ability to do things. Now, of course, of the spectra that came out of that mass spec, we were able to use approximately 1 100th of the data. Because most of that data, all the peaks, the mass M over Z peaks, we have no interpretation for. It's a massive challenge in understanding what that chemistry is. A lot of it, we know what it is. We know how they're changing, though. And of course, imaging is changing. And I won't go through that, because it's hard to see on the screen and whatever. The other big thing which has changed, and I'll hopefully I'll get to talk about this in a little bit, whoops, in a little bit, has been our information systems. So a couple of things. It's just saying that you know, a lot of other things are scaling. Um, synthesis is scaling. Proteome is scaling, and so on. But very importantly, algorithms are beginning to scale. and so. Um, in systems that I'm building right now, I'll have out, when I get a paper to review, for example, when I send out a paper for review, I'll have applied on the order between 40 and 150 algorithms to the data before it gets plotted on the screen, which should get everyone pause, because I can lie at any point in that algorithmic screen, right? I can change a parameter, I can I can use, I can report a poor statistic, I could transform the data incorrectly, all that stuff could happen. It's very hard to review. But the point is that I have algorithms that do everything from, from assembly to annotation to prediction of function to assembly and to prediction of metabolic networks to prediction of the metabolic networks over thousands of conditions to the evolution of those networks and so on, all arrayed in the common space. And I can begin to operate on this data in ways you couldn't operate before. So these things are changing how we do things. And we have tools that bring them all together. And this is just an example of one of the tools that we use, which is a metabolic network viewer. And every little dot's a metabolite, and every, every little bar is a reaction. This is a common plot. And this whole thing is plotted on a phylogenetic tree. So all those different colors are colors that appear on the ring of that phylogenetic tree and tell me which microbes have which parts of these pathways and so on. And we can navigate this in real time and show data on it and begin to compute on it. So we're at a point now where we have the, the wherewithal to navigate through this. But the tools for using this for prediction and design are still lagging behind. So my argument is we have to make this work. And I'm going to try to tell you how we're going to do it. Remember, I talked about two-dimensional spaces. Synthetic biology, which is, on the one hand, the ability to engineer new function in cells, which we've had since the 70s, but is doing so predictably, which is what the new thing is, um, has, a, has a weird history. I'm going to put in two different, two different axes here where I think synthetic biology sits. We have this discovery and design axis. So I can discover things or I can design them. And, and, and so synthetic biology should be out in design, right? And you have things that you design or discover, pipes. So I want to turn glucose into a fatty acid. Well, that happens in your cells all the time. There's a pipe that does it. And it's pretty much a linear chain of reactions. There may be branches off of it, but it's a linear chain of reactions. And there are programs. So the fact that you started as an ova and became you is a program. There's a lot of different logic that had to happen to get all those cells in order. So that's my two-dimensional space. And so synthetic biology theoretically should be in the upper right-hand corner, if at all possible. 
So there are examples of these things. We have programs like these natural ecotypes. There are, for example, industrially, industrially evolved yeasts. So we actually study how yeasts that, 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 that evolve in Brazilian ethanol plants um, take over those ethanol plants and become either more efficient or kill the reactors. And a lot of these guys, the things that the, that the, that the Brazilians use are all found organisms. They came in from the outside and they evolved in those reactors and they're better than anything we can make ourselves. They're evolved programs, you don't know why they work. There's useful enzymes. There's the enzymes we use for deconstruction of cellul cellulose into sugars to feed to our bugs. Those are all found and evolved. <laughs> we have very few cases of real protein engineering. Very few cases of real protein engineering. People who are protein engineering or the audience are gonna frown at me when I say this. Most protein engineering is either a little bit of dots and twiddles or it's directed evolution, which is cool. Frances Arnold is the, the, the queen of all, you know, directed evolution. But, but David Baker actually did the things de novo. <laughs> and he actually computed how to make a completely novel enzyme activity not seen on Earth, retroactive activity. That's an example of synthetic biology in my book. And then you have these things out here. And what I want to be able to do is to build cells out there that, that we engineered in the soil to, for example, mobilize phosphorus or fix nitrogen. The problem is, is that it's very hard to get there because of an economic problem and a social problem. I obviously want to get there by re I don't want to build it from scratch. I want to start with something that lives there and then build on top of that. I want to do that. But I want to be able to do that. But the problem, whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. Most of the world is sitting over there in meta modern meta metabolic engineering, making a chemical. It's because chemical engineering has been around for a long time and we know how to do chemical process control. No one worries about whether or not those bugs are going to get out of the reactors. They're pretty contained, number one. And number two, they're not doing anything dangerous, really. Um, and, and three, there's a, there's a chemical market for the chemicals that are made that is immediate and apparent. There's a design barrier. It's very hard to design these complicated things up here. I'm going to try to break that, show you how we're breaking that today. But there's a social barrier as well in that that starts touching things that people get very nervous about out on the edge there. They get worried that you're going to kill them or hurt the environment or something. And despite the fact that most natural biological disasters are, are caused by people like moving a boat from Malaysia to the United States as opposed to doing anything else, people still get very nervous about this. And there's very little of use in the middle area where you're sort of not quite out in the world and yet you're building things that would hunt and kill a tumor in a human being. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, either you hunt and killing tumors or you're not. There's not something in between, really. So there's, there's not a lot of pull from, from mid-level applications. And we're dealing with that right now in weird ways. We call that you know, the uncanny valley. I like using that because in, in LA in particular, because it's, it's used to describe in computer graphics the fact that computer graphics are getting better and better and you can simulate human beings, but they looked kind of gross and awful and looked uncanny. And so similarly, we're beginning to simulate bugs in, in jars that could be a tumor-killing bacteria, but they're really frightening looking. And so the Uncali Valley. So this gets down to this problem of trust and how I got into the field to begin with. Most engineers, especially those who are making chemicals, really are interested in effect. How much chemical can I make? And you don't have to worry about trust because pretty much you, just, you can just sterilize your reactors and you're done. But when you begin to start doing something more intimate, when I want to put a bug inside of you, or I want to put a bug in the environment or in the ocean, God help me. <laughs> I have to be a lot more careful. I have to have your trust. Only way I'm going to get this accomplished. And by the way, I want to do it because I don't want to do anything bad. So I'm interested in this aspect over here. How do you gain trust? Because I kind of know how to get effect most of the time. Effect's kind of easy most of the time. I mean, I don't know what drug I need to give you to cure your cancer, but if you give me a drug I need to make, I can figure out a pathway to get there. It might be a very bad pathway but it's a pathway. Doing it so trustworthy is hard. I'll give you an example of an early set of thought we had. The early set of thought was this. Imagine that I wanted to build a treatment for HIV. Problem with the HIV treatments currently are that they're expensive. You generate resistance to them very rapidly. You take a cocktail. It's very likely you're going to be resistant. You're going to be make, the one minute of the cocktail will make you sick, personally. It has massive side effects. Um, and people go on drug holidays because they don't like, the, they don't like taking the drugs. And, they, and, and there's another weird sociological event. If you introduce a prophylaxis into a community, say a condom, people will tend to have as much sex as it takes to overcome the prophylaxis. <laughs> and so in, in certain countries like Botswana, people, have a, you know, people in the middle class were having an average of 31 sexual partners. <laughs> and so the network was huge. And so, even, so if you went off on a drug holiday, you still got this 
massive you know, outflux. So we thought, wouldn't it be great if I could have a one-shot treatment for HIV that also was sexually transmittable? <laughs> Yeah, so you're all looking at me like, oh my god. Yeah. I was a computational biologist back then, so I was no danger to anybody. OK? <laughs> so what we decided to do is to use a model that had been built by a group of people who had really validated a clinical model of HIV dynamics in the human body, Alan Perelson and Don Ho, David Ho and this group. And the basic model says this. I'm going to take a virus that's going to be able to infect a T cell. It will be able to replicate in the T cell. It will break out of the T cell and infect other T cells. That's basically the, the fundamental model. And all we do is imagine we had a virus that would infect T cells and just hang out in there and do nothing until HIV infected that cell. And then when it did, it would steal HIV's capsid and downregulate HIV and it would mobilize itself to the next cell. So it was a conditionally replicating lentivirus. And it was cool because it only required two engineerable parameters, how well you compete for the capsid and how much you downregulate HIV. Otherwise, you could just use HIV's parameters. And that's what we did. We actually said, imagine it was HIV. And we took out all the stuff that makes HIV HIV, except for its promoter and things like that. And we packaged it. I mean, we built this little model that showed that if you take those two parameters, you could get this very robust decrease in virions in the blood. And therefore, you'd vastly delay onset into AIDS, one-shot therapy. And really cool, you could have sex with people, and you'd transmit the therapy virus. <laughs> Bonus. <laughs> of course, we thought this was nuts. We thought it was a great little model. We published it, and it was cool. And Carl June and a company called Varixis built it without us. They built it. And this is actually real patient data there. Um, patient full-blown AIDS, taking full regimen of anti-age anti blood. They have a blood titer of about um, uh, 10 to the fourth there, I think, or 10 to the fifth. They're given the treatment at that place where the arrow is pointing down. And over the course of a year, blood titer drops completely. This went to phase three clinical trials and the economy crashed and the company crashed. But, but cool. Of course, this wasn't the one-shot therapy. The way that it works is you actually sit down. You have to be very rich. <laughs> and they A for each 10 billion T cells. And you look at each T cell and go, this is a good T cell, this is a bad T cell. I think the T cells, they infect it with this therapy virus outside of you. They do the quality control and they put the cells back into you. Very expensive treatment, so not for the common man. Um, but it was very effective. And then the graduate student who did this with us went off and became a professor at the Gladstone Institute. And he actually did a big model of the epidemiology, all the way from the molecular mechanisms all the way up to the epidemiology of the system, and showed how, the control, how this, would, this would stem the tide of HIV. That, to me, is a synthetic biology model and design. That end to end, from molecules to the effect on society at the end. That's where it should go, you know? Um, but that's scary stuff. The amount, of la the, the amount of ignorance shown on this plot is exponentially larger than the amount of knowledge. <laughs> and so, you know, exciting, but, you know, let's take it step by step and see how it goes. So we thought, let's do something simpler than that, less epidemiological, and let's build a bacterium that was a really smart drug, a uh, bacterium that hunt and kill, that hunt and kill the tumor. Um, most smart drugs are basically liposomes that have antibodies on their surface or other affinity agents that will target it to an overexpressed antigen on the surface of a, of, a, of a tumor. And then the natural processes of cell biology will ingest that liposome and then open it up and dump the kill signal, which is buried inside. That's a smart drug. Um, we thought bacteria could be really smart drugs because they have multiple sensors. They would be able to logic on whether or not it really was in a cancer cell versus not. And if it really was in a cancer cell, it could deliver the kill. And we thought we were very clever when we thought of this. Actually, do you know one of the first Anyone know when the first therapy, uh, bacterial therapy for cancer was done? Give, give a decade. Anyone want to best? Devin, oh, 80s. 80s. Actually, very close. Yeah, very close to the 80s. 1880s. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, 1868 uh, was the first one. German doctor, Frederick Bush, had a had two, two patients in a, bed, in, in a bed, and this is you know German hospitals, long rows of beds, no private rooms. And uh, he had a woman with this inoperable throat sarcoma, and it was this really big, bloody massacre of a throat sarcoma. He couldn't really operate on it because it's right together, veins and everything. Um, and in the bed next door, literally the bed next door, this guy is dying of a disease at the time. It was called erypheus, which is, um, it turns out to be Streptococcus pyrogenes. So those of you who are science historians will know that 1868 is pre-Pasteur. So we don't know what this thing is. 
All we know is this guy has an infective disease that is eating his flesh. So he's getting, he's getting liquefied. <laughs> and the guy, woman in the bed next to him is getting overgrown. And this guy has this Reese's peanut butter cup moment. And he's like, ah, you know. <laughs> Chocolate and peanut butter. <laughs> so, so, no kidding. You know? So he just, so this guy dies. He's like, okay, here's my chance. So he takes this woman, he cuts open her throat sarcoma, and he cauterizes the veins, and he sticks her into this bed that this guy died in. And lo and behold, the tumor went away. And then she died. <laughs> Streptococcus pyrogenes. Um, William Coley in 1982 isolated that the endotoxin became the first chemotherapy. Um, but, but the point is that people thought of this for a long time. And there is a, one successful bacterial chemotherapy these days, and that is for bladder cancer. It's Mycobacterium bovis BCG. It sits in your bladder. Uh, secretes IL-18, brings macrophage into your bladder, and it clears the, the, the tumor. Very interesting. We didn't know that when we started this project, because we're ignorant, ignoramuses, but there you are. Um, we thought, wouldn't it be great, though, if we could have a bacterium and you'd inject it into a human being, because we like to inject things. Evidently, that's what we like to do. <laughs> and we would, we would sense that we were in the blood. And if we were in the blood, we would, we would we'd have, we'd have a number of signals that have to integrate, the signal integration layer. And we make sure that we had shielding up, because we like, we're, you know, we're nerds, so it has to be called shielding. And uh, the shielding would be uh, something that prevented it from causing an immune response, from being eaten by immune cells, and yet would not cause sepsis somehow. We would not allow the cells to grow in your blood, because, you know, that would be bad. Um, and, and then we'd also, um, well, we have another, another, another safety, safety mechanism I won't get into at the moment. We have to be able to sense. So it turns out, this is something that we should, you should have to know. So it turns out that when you die, and you all shall die at some point, unless a singularity occurs before long, um, when we open you up, and we will, <laughs> uh, you'll, you'll all have tumors inside of you. And inside the tumors, there will be bacteria, because bacteria love living inside tumor cells. Love living inside, tumors, in tu inside tumor um, necrotic region. There's a lot of food there. It's anaerobic. Immune cells can't get in. And so, they just like, so we want to be able to sense that we're in that environment. And if we're in that environment, we want to drop our shields. We want to turn on specific adhesion molecules. And we want to invade nearby cells. Just because the cell's nearby, though, doesn't mean it's a cancer cell. So once we're inside, we want to say, hey, are we in a cancer cell? So we break out of the vacuole, because the vacuole is too low information. And we ask, are we a cancer cell? And if so, you dump the kill. That's the idea. So that's our design. So we started off as finding actuators. So this is a growth controller. This is a high affinity uh, iron trans uh, co-transporter. Prevents cells from scavenging iron in the blood. And so in this case, they can remain, remain metabolically active, but they can't grow. But to turn on and off ton B, I can either scavenge iron from, from the blood and therefore grow, or if I turn it off, I can't scavenge iron in the blood and I can't grow. So I can turn this on and off. That's an actuator. This is a safety valve. I delete an entire pathway that's involved in making the cell wall of my microbe. It can't live without it. You don't make this metabolite. So I feed you this metabolite, and our bacterium can live, but it can't get beyond you, as an example. Here's my shield. It's a capsule. This is where everything went wrong. <laughs> so we built this capsule. So E. coli in the lab looks like, looks like the guy on the, on, the, on the left there. And real E. coli looks like the guy on the right. Real E. coli is a big puffy cloud. It has polysaccharides and proteins and sugars, and it's just sitting in this cloud of stuff. And that protects it from being eaten by you. Uh, and so we decided we'd engineer that back onto a blank E. coli, a nice blank E. coli that's otherwise non-pathogenic, and prevent it from being eaten. And we could show that we could make it survive longer in blood and not cause inflammation, inflammatory response. Um, giving away the story, when you put it into a mouse, it didn't help it at all. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> uh, this is cool. Stanley Falco uh, 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 found this protein called Invasin. It's a big rod-shaped protein. It, you put it on a styrofoam bead, it will invade cancer cells. Um, because it likes beta-1 integrin, and it triggers beta-1 integrin taking it in. And, and so we take all these different cancer cell lines, cervical carcinoma, osteocarcinoma, hepatocarcinoma, and breast epithelial cells. They can show that when you express invasin, all these bacteria will invade those cancer cells, but they will not invade a normal cell. And the reason why they won't invade normal cells is because normal cells don't make enough beta-1 integrin on the surface to actually be found in this reaction. So here's a bunch of actuators. This gives you some sense of what we're doing. So now we have to figure out ways of doing sensors. So the idea here was is that things that separate different tissues are going to be multifactorial. And so you can imagine, this is, by the way, a cartoon, obviously. This is not really what's going on. But you can imagine that a tumor might be low oxygen, low glucose. But it could be high oxygen, you know, low glucose, organs, high glucose, high oxygen, whatever. 
And so we wanted to have sensors that could do the logic there and say only when you're in the tumor do you do your job, for example. Luckily, since the war on cancer had been made, we had lots and lots and lots and lots of data about different tissue measurements. And so we had everything from, you know, pH and amino acids and glucose and lactate and cholesterol, basically everywhere in the body. You could actually get anywhere you want in the body. Someone has made a measurement of what the, on average, the behavior is in that environment. And so we had all that stuff. And so we then simulated those things. And you can see how old the slide is by the next piece of it. Um, we did gene expression experiments with spotted microarrays. Oh, God. Thank God that's over. <laughs> um, and we were able to find promoters that fired under every condition that distinguished one tissue from another. So things that were high pH and low pH and what, over, over the right range and so on. We found all these promoters. Um, for quorum sensing, we used the one from Vibrio fisheri. This, is, this uh, uh, senses density of cells. It's very cool. The cells secrete something that get, get, gets reuptaken. It's only when there's enough cells, is there enough stuff reuptaken that it can turn on its system. So it's a quorum sensing system. And what's cool about this is that if you take any bacterium, more or less, and you inject it into a mouse, say a mouse tail vein, and you inject that bacterium into a mouse, or that population into a mouse, within 20 minutes, it's all over the mouse. Every part of the mouse has a bacterium in it except for the brain. Uh, more or less. Um, and within two days, they all localize to a single tumor on the in a leg of this particular mouse. So it doesn't really matter what bacteria you use. Use them. Choose your favorite. <laughs> and that's what will happen. Um, and so it's about 10 to the third higher density there than any place else in the mouse's body. And so we could use a quorum sensor to say, if you're in the tumor microenvironment, then you can be at this density. And so at this density, do this. All actuators. So then we began to hook things together. So here's an actuator hooked to a, to a quorum sensor, an, inv an invasion hooked to a quorum sensor. Keep hoping this is going to work, but it's not going to. Um, so what you're seeing in the top plot over there is as density increases, you get more and more invasion into this thing. And we set, the question is, how do you set that threshold when they begin to invade? Because that's important. As a designer, the threshold is important. We want to know at, at this density, do it. And at the time, we had no theory to guide us and no parts to use. So we did what every good chemical biologist does, which is we made a library of things and then selected for the one that worked. So we made this little promoter, this little RBS library, and then screened it for activity, and then found the ones that did the right thing. And we did very similar things for doing anaerobic, uh, doing anaerobic invasion and, and sensing of sugars and so on. So now we had sensors, and we had actuators. We needed logic gates to put them together. So we started building logic gates. This is an example of a dumb logic gate. It's an early logic gate, but it works pretty damn well, given how dumb it is. And the way that it works is you have these two promoters, which take in you know, transcription factor signals. And if one transcription factor is on or the other one is on, nothing happens. If both are on, you make both those genes. One gene is this polymerase, a T7, a viral polymerase. We've made stop codons into it. And that stop codon prevents it from being translated. And so it won't work. On the other arm, we use a tRNA to that stop codon. <laughs> And in this case, we've made it charged with a serine, so it will pass through. So if the suppressor tRNA is made, I can translate the T7, and I can make the downstream gene. So now I can, if one promoter and the other, I get an output. And this is what it kind of looks like. If one promoter and the other, I get an output. Those are, those are flow histograms that show that if one, one or the other, nothing happens. If neither one, nothing happens. If both are on, you get a high response. That's the sort of transfer function. We had a mathematical model. Everything was cool. We thought it was cool. Then we began to put it all together. And this was really big. So ultimately, the full design was approximately um, 500 kilobases of DNA, which is, you know, given it's a 400, a four megabase genome, you know, is not, not an insignificant fraction of, of the genome. This is just the piece for invasion. It has this idea that you're going to generate some payload. You're going to have an invasion module, which is the invasin. You're going to have a vacuole sensing module, which says that I know I'm in a vacuole. I'm going to have a vacuole lysis device so I can kill the vacuole. I'm going, to have a I'm going to have a device that lyses myself so I can deliver my kill. I'm doing something here, which is weird. I wonder if that's the um, battery or something. What's on the wall? Oh, it's a phone. <laughs> OK. Someone, someone can answer that. <laughs> no worries. It'll go away, I'm sure. <laughs> 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 I don't think I want to call. No, it's gone, it's gone. Okay, so look. 
So the idea was is that you we put all the, so so we had all the all these models of how this thing worked, and we measured all this stuff, and, and ultimately we put it together, and this is sort of what happened. Give you some sense of how we start characterizing these things. We first started with the payload device and the and the and the invasion device, and when you did that, what you're seeing here is on the left of that box is a field of cells, as sort of a field of a single cell. We're looking at a single cell, and if you zoom in one of the bright clusters, that's a single vacuole. Then that vacuole is, a, is bacteria. And as you can see, they got in, and they are making this fluorescent moiety. So that, that kind of worked. Whoops. Is it right? No? Yes? Go back there. Now we added the vacuole sensing device and the self license device. So in this case, it's supposed to be know that it's inside a vacuole. And when it's inside a vacuole, it's supposed to try to lice itself. And what happened in this case was that it's hard to see here. But it failed. Even though the self license device worked in a jar, meaning when I had it in, living, in, living in, a, in this solution, it would lice itself just fine. When it was in a vacuole, there was something about the vacuolar environment which prevented the actual bacterium from opening up. So we had to muck about. And we mucked about by adding another protein to it, this BRP protein. And then you can see the vacuole just becomes full of brightness. Then we added the vacuole lysis device. And when we did that, what you're seeing here you can't see this very well, because you know lights are too high. But we have a red cell here. You have to believe me. <laughs> Green nuclei, blue DNA, because of the stain. And we merged them together, and you can see we delivered something to the nucleus, something to the cytosol, and the whole thing works. But it took a lot of work to get that to function. A lot of testing around, and we put the whole thing into a mouse. It just died. Now, the guy who did this, Chris Anderson and Chris Voigt, who was a both postdoc to my lab before they became little professors, they, Chris Anderson won a MIT TR35 award for this. And the first day that the, the award was announced, this was the first comment on the announcement, and it was from God, which I thought was cool. <laughs> but it turns out that God's sarcastic. <laughs> Engineered cancer fighting bacteria, yeah, all we need is a bacteria designed to evade the immune system and release toxic enzymes. Nothing could go wrong with that. Obviously, nothing is uh, it's exempt from the law of unintended consequences. Well, that's not really a law. That's just an anecdote. But the point is that someone's worried about it. I understand that. And it all comes down to this problem of context. And we're, I'm going to go a little bit quickly, but I want you to get some sense of things. The question of context is, when I try these different things out, every time I tried it out, I had to tune it a little bit. And every time I moved it to a new environment, I had to tune it a little bit more. And as the number of parts become larger and larger, I start having to tune it in a multidimensional space, and it becomes nearly impossible. So I need to start designing things that respect that context, but are also insulated against it. That's their job. So we began to start classifying context. Most of the things, those of you who are interested, we published a couple of papers classifying all these context effects, where we, we sort of figure out what are the things we really have to worry about, and how do we begin to guard against them, and how do we begin to measure them? So this is really where I think rubber meets the road. And there's a bunch of different of these types of, of, of effects that we really talk about. One is the environment itself, high temperature and low temperature, different contexts, right? The host in which you, which you exist is a context. The composition amongst the parts, when they're actually put together, that changes their functionality, both by physical and functional interconnect. And there's genetic, meaning actually, you know, really what, you know, what is the, the genes around what I'm working on. And ultimately, we could come up with a whole bunch of these different things and how you would measure them. So what, you know, what's varying? What needs to be measured? How do we model it? And how do we predict it? It's a very complicated chart. But the thing to take away is that in each case, the design is we're going, to we're going to work over a set of controlled variation in a, in a design of experiments. And we're going to make a model of how that context affects things. And, we're going to, we're going to, uh, and then we're going to predict what happens next. And we're going to try to capture the uncertainty along the way. So um, that's where we get to synthetic biology, in my, in my opinion. So here we go. What we're going to do, we're going to do environment host genetic. Let's go through quickly. So let's take the environment first. We're going to vary the environment. We're going to measure the phenotype as we measure changes in the host. So we're going to measure genetic changes in the host and how, ask how every change in the host is affected, uh, 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 it impacts a phenotype dependent on the environment in which that host exists. OK? Let's not talk about this one. Let's talk about this one. OK. Here's a chart. This looks like a, mic like a microarray experiment or something, but it's not. What you have here is. Um, a set of conditions that we tried. 
And then on this axis is all the genes. And the thing is blue if when you knock out that gene in that environment, the cell does not like it. And it's yellow if the cell thinks, thank you. <laughs> that was good. Knock out that gene in that environment. First thing to say is there's blue and yellow. That is not all genes are needed for a given environment. And in some cases, you know, knocking it out is good, even so it means that they're expressing it and they shouldn't be. And so it turns out that we can then classify things by these objects. What we found out in this particular case was, for example, this case we were looking at a organism that makes ethanol in very, very complicated reactor environments, under cases where it was under high stress. And we found a few things here. We found that we screened this over 60 industrial-like environments. We found how every gene confers the ability to both produce ethanol and allow the cell to survive under these environments. That allowed us to actually annotate these genes. We actually got biochemical functions from this, which is kind of interesting. And it allowed us to figure out which, how genes should be expressed to optimize production while minimizing impact on health, on its health. And then we built those bugs and were able to make them produce better in these complicated environments using the situation. So it's an example of how to take environmental context and turn it into a design for genetic context. So this is your cluster that we're talking about there. Now, it turns out that what's very cool about this is that you know that most genes you look up and say, for example, GenBank, are annotated by homology. That is, by reference to some other gene. And generally, by some reference to some other gene that is not itself annotated, but, but is annotated by homology. And so you have this A is like B is like C is like D is like E is like, like F. And so F is like A, right? Of course, that's not true. So what was, this technology allowed us to do is we can now get phenotypes for every gene. So this year, in my own laboratory, to give me something of the scaling technology, we've done 100 environmental microorganisms, knockouts of every gene under hundreds of environments. And we're able to map those gene that make that gene to environment map. And we're making these environments more and more realistic. So we're beginning to do gut simulations and, and soil simulations and things like this. OK. Now that gives you some idea of how we're approaching environment. How do we approach host? This is an example of a really interesting experiment where we took a cassette. This is a, just, a, just a gene expression cassette which had three fluorescent proteins on it and passed it into all 4,000 knockout strains of E. coli and then asked how gene expression changed. And the answer was that, first of all, so this is just showing you two, two, different, there's two different colors here, yellow and red in that middle plot, this one over here. And you can see there's a wide array of expression levels. And certain genes are really out, out in, the, in, in the end there. And so those genes are ones in which, if you knock them out, greatly overexpress these proteins. It happened to be genes involved in pent pentose phosphate shunt in this particular case, oddly enough. But it turns out that we were able to map this all the way down to the fact that these really impacted ribosomal behaviors. So we were able to map a pathway by which heteroligous pathways, plasmid maintenance, impacts ribosome availability and impacts the ability of proteins to be expressed. And now I've mapped those pathways, and I have a model for how host genes serve resource to heterologous systems and impact the ability of that heterologous system to function. So I'm getting a map now that maps environment and host genes together, then host genes to heterologous circuit function. OK, that's the mapping. Now we're using this new technology called CAS. And you'll hear a lot about this this term, I'm sure. So CAS is a, is a, is a, is a protein that is an RNA-guided endonuclease that will cleave where an RNA guides it to. Um, and it's very, very cool. It's used in, in bacterial um, um, phage defense. And I won't go into why that is. Um, we modified it in such a way that the, the enzyme couldn't cleave, so I could use it for regulation. This was published in Cell with um, Wendell Lim and John Weissman and, uh, and my student, Stanley Chi. And the point here is that I could use this little RNA to guide this Cas9 directly to a point, and I could block polymerase from binding, polymerase from processing, or transcriptase from binding. So that meant that I could turn on and off genes using this thing. So now I have a way of scalably making regulation. And I could, turn, I could turn one or two genes on and off by having two different guide RNAs. It's portable, because all it depends upon is that protein and that RNA. So I could do it in mammalian cells and in bacterial cells. I could turn them on and off, and I could predict exactly where it stopped. So then ultimately, I could use this platform and make thousands of guide RNAs. And then I could screen across every nucleotide in an organism that had a PAM sequence near it and ask how blocking polymerase or blocking transcription factor at that location caused a change in its behavior. And so we just run across the entire genome 
And we're able to do things like this. We could find that, we could find all the essential genes immediately in whatever condition we wanted to. And so as an example, we did aerobic versus anaerobic growth, and we're able to find genes that are only important anaerobically, uh, are only important anaerobically, are only important aerobically, and we found two genes that were considered essential to E. coli, that are only essential aerobically, but they didn't know that. And they're otherwise dispensable. And so now we'll be able to, to, to not only build regulatory circuits using these things, but use this in the way of doing the systems biology side of things. So then, now that we have this, this ability to edit in place very rapidly, we can do things like combine evolutionary work with this work. So we went out to the, to the environment and found all these industrialized yeasts that work really well. We did a clever mating trick to map all the allelic differences between these strains that led to their abilities to do their job. This is called quantitative trait mapping. And this graph shows you all the places on the chromosome where one strain was better than the other. And then I could use this technology to rapidly ramp up and down in a single strain all those different regions. And I could start to build um, um, super, super strains. But what, 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 what that took was something very interesting. I can now get to the point where I get 80% efficiency at doing between three and 10 variations in one pot. So now I have this ra very rapid control to do this. Now what's important about that is I now have these two things here. I can map environment to host, host to heterologous function, and then I can re-regulate at a very high throughput based on this CRISPR technology. Now I'm gonna do one more thing. I know it's getting late. I'm gonna start doing this genetic capability. So now I'm gonna take all the pieces I'm gonna put together I'm going to begin to figure out how to work with those. Ideally, what I'd have is I'd have a library of parts, promoters and UTRs and coding sequences and, five prime, and three prime UTRs that I'd be able to pick from to make whatever expression cassette I wanted would have exactly the behavior that I wanted in that context, ideally. And so we have these libraries that we've made somewhat rationally, in this case, except for that Robert S. library, which is not rational at all. Um, and we try to put them together. Now, here's what the idea is. The idea is that we could pick a, a, a high, medium, and low promoter and a high, medium, and low UTR, and then combine them together, theoretically, they should form this sort of faded pattern, where if both are strong, it's very high. If both are weak, it's very weak, and in between, it's somewhere in between. And that's what it looks like when you really do it. And OK, I mean, if you're a typical biologist, that looks great, right? <laughs> it's red down there and blue up there. but you know, I, Still red guys back over that way and up there and this blue guy way over there. And what's more is that these are the same promoters and UTRs with two different genes. And they're different. And that's a pain. As an engineer, that pains me. So we did an analysis. We built a, a library of these and we did a statistical analysis that sort of showed where variation comes from. So for example, if you just look at, at um, fluorescence, The UTR, the RBS, accounts for a lot of it. Promoter for another part, good. But there's this whole bunch which is accounted for by the interaction between the RBS and the gene itself. And there's a whole bunch that's actually because of the interaction between the promoter and the UTR. So there's something about those two interactions that make, make a thing. And so we quantified all that. And we could say, yeah, these promoters and these RBSs have sort of a mean strength. But those blue and red bars you see there are how much they vary under the context of the other pieces in which they're hooked to genetically. So for example, those three RBSs all have the same strength, but their variances are extremely different. You see? So if I want to choose which one to use, I want to use U6 and not U11, because U11 will change its strength depending on who it's connected to whereas U6 maintains it. But I can make a model out of this, and I can tell, show you that, that um, well, I can show you that you know, I can get pretty good predictions. This is the observed for us as a predictor. So I have this in my freezer, and I say that I want to get um, you know, this fluorescence. I can predict, to some degree, how it's going to go. But as an engineer, I hate that curve, that line. It's pretty good, but it's very noisy. My trust is low. So I'm going to begin to, so it turns out that that interaction space is what's important. And I'll give you an example of how we break that apart. So we use, in this case, a leader sequence, which loads ribosomes on early before you get to the gene, and they basically break up structure. And they rebind upstream of that broken structure. And so if I take all those ribosome binding sites that I showed you in the last thing, so this is um, 
ribosome binding sites, there in, in, in each one of these things is a, is a uh, each line is a different RBS over a number of different genes, you see they're very noisy. So they don't maintain their strength. When I do that, I start getting much flatter lines. As it turns out, I can convert things that look like these checkerboards to that checkerboard there. So now instead of it being a checkerboard where I have you know, my, my RBS and the gene looking crazy, when I have RBS and gene, now they look nice and clean. And when I add, do a, a plot like I did before with promoters and UTRs, now I get these beautiful fades to the point where now I can, within, within, with a 90% chance, be within a factor of two or less of my predicted behavior. So doing pretty good there. Now, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna we, we're running out of time, we've run out of time, so I'm gonna just gonna tell you a little bit about what we've done next. We've gotten to the point now where we can get this to almost extreme precision. By cleaving up the RNA into different modular units, by isolating pieces from each other, by controlling the host physiology, we can begin to get extremely predictable programmable behavior. And we can know what we have to program for the different environments by doing this environmental mapping I showed you before. We've gotten so good at this, I won't go through that stuff. We've gotten so good at this that we've been able to add other elements on into the system. So we've been able to get regulators, for example, that we can place into the RNA, and we can do things like this. So in this case, imagine I had a regulator that I could place on the RNA where I could activate it using a small RNA or repress it using a small RNA. If I put one after the other, then I should activate and then repress. I just get this little bandpass filter. It turns out I can build almost anything out of this sort of processive logic. And, to give, and so these are, I won't tell you what these are because they're, they're all published now, so you can look them up in these, in these journal articles. But they're little RNA regulated circuits, so now I can design them all by hand, and they're all big scalable orthogonal circuits. Um, but when I'm done with all this stuff, what it allows me to do is this I can make a, I can, I can characterize one of these guys. I can characterize the other of these guys, an, on, an off switch and an on switch. I can then fit those things and predict what I'll get out, and that's what I get. So I'm getting pretty good. I'm getting pretty good at this. Um, and it's getting so good now that I can build on a single transcript a four input NOR gate, for example. And I can build arbitrary logics up to about four or five inputs on a single transcript, which is actually a very compact logic. The, the biggest logic circuit built is built by Chris Voigt from a postdoc of mine now at MIT. He built a five input AND gate. But to do that, he used a large number of promoters and regulators. So now we have this much more compact. And we can use RNAs and they can sense things. We can come to proteins and small molecules and make this whole sensory and I won't go into that. But the point is that we get, we're at the point now where, where I can get this very extreme ordering of how gene expression works. I can make these logics on these promoters, and I can make them operate in a very reliable way. And I'm just now getting to the point where I can modulate the resource balance so that as environments change, they don't change their behavior. We're just getting there now. That, that, that mapping is happening. And we're beginning to do this at all these different levels. We have, we have a group working on the signaling proteins. We have one that's working on... Um, uh, making memory switches this way. This is published in, in NSB. We have DNA logic circuits we're working on, which flip DNA around. Um, and we're getting to the point now where we can build libraries. This is the last sort of thing I'll talk about, really, just right in this one slide, really. Is that this is an example where we did 255,000 variants of a single gene. And that's how every nucleotide not only impacted its ability to express, but how many ribosomes it sucked up, how much it put a load on the cell, and so on. And they, one student was able to make all these measurements after everything was designed <laughs> over the course of a couple weeks. We spent a year analyzing it. <laughs> okay? The point here is that you, what you're seeing here is protein abundance. This is one, one plot for the data. You're protein abundance on this axis and fitness on this axis, how well the cell grew. The color is how strong the RNA structure was across the RBS. So the, so the, the stronger the structure, the less protein you get, but also the deader the cell is. And what's going on there is you're sequestering ribosomes, not releasing them. Up on this side, ribosomes are fine, but you're making a whole lot of protein. And so now you're getting to kill the cell by eating too much energy. So using this, we were able to quantify the levels at which you begin to eat too many ribosomes or eat too many resources from the cell. And we now know how every nucleotide plays a role in this behavior. So now, nucleotide level, gene level interaction, gene to host, host to environment. 
all in the space of a few years. So I think we're making a lot of progress. I won't go through that. Oh, just to give you some simple things. What was very cool was we actually made a model of the whole process. So this is the actual, this is a five-dimensional data where you have the protein expression, pile number of polysomes and fitness. It's colored by RNA amount, and the size is the uh, is uh, is the half life, right? And then this is the model of the whole process. And you know, it's not bad. <laughs> we're getting better at it. Not not perfect. Um, okay, just to say that, that we're bringing this all together now. So I think that um, I'm going to stop at this slide, and then I'm going to go through the acknowledgments. One of the big things we've been able to accomplish on top of this is we now have data systems that can handle all this information. You should all go and visit, especially over the next few months, revisit kbase.us. This is the DOE Systems Biology Knowledge Base, which, which I run. And what it's doing is bringing all this, biological model, all this biological knowledge together. Now, you've seen biological databases before. And this is kind of like that, but it allows you to upload your own data, operate with it, share it with your colleagues, show people how you did things like that. But the subversive thing going on behind the scenes is there's a big modeling tool going behind this, which is making models of all that data and making predictions on it. But it's also looking about how you do it. <laughs> and it's trying to ask, how do you come to conclusions? And it's learning from that to try to figure things out. We call this thing KBase. It's very, very cool. And you can see some of it at kbase.us now. I won't go through this now. So I just want to acknowledge the people who did the work groups. People who did the work. Um, here they are. Um, that's the group. And more importantly, let me give you some names because I think they're important to know. Drew Wendy was my, my was the guy who I worked on the on the on the on the extreme um, extreme gene expression predictability with. Well, the guys who did the work were Vivek Metallic and Guillaume Cambre. Guillaume also did that beautiful 255,000 nuclear. You know, Guillaume is spectacular and is on the market at the moment. <laughs> Stefano Cardinale did all the work on the host context work. Um, Chris Anderson and Chris Voigt did the tumor killing bacteria. All the stuff on environmental mapping was done by Adam Deutschbauer and Jeff Skirker. And these, Je Adam has been able to scale the pipelines. He's turned it into a service that you can actually order now. If you have a microbe that you want to understand how every gene confers the ability of it to do something under a large number of conditions, you can order those experiments done. And the Joint Gene Institute, working with our lab and his lab, will do it for you as a service. So we're at a point now where this is becoming commodity. And so I just urge you to get in contact if you want to do something like that. And that's it. Thanks a lot for your attention and your patience.